بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The lecture of this day about the disorder of the cranial nerves Objectives the, to describe this function and the clinical manifestation of the visual and the optomotor systems and to approach a patient to the visual and the optomotor dysfunctions and uh, the, to describe functional anatomy of the cranial nerves and disease affecting them with the proper management of each cranial neuropathy. First, we start with the neuroophthalmology. Characteristic clinical disturbance result from lesion of the second, third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerve. Clinically, the optic nerve behaves as though it were primarily carrying central visual information. Therefore, lesions of the optic nerve may produce a combination of following loss of visual acuity diminished color perception depression of the central field in a central scotoma defective pupillary reaction to light third cranial nerve palsy a complete third cranial nerve lesion causes stosis and inability to rotate the eye upward downward or inward when the lid is passively elevated the eye is found to be deviated outward and slightly downward because of the unopposed intact actions of the lateral rectus and the superior oblique muscles the lateral rectus will will draw the eye laterally and horizontally and laterally and the superior rectus superior oblique will uh, uh, try to entorch Entort, entors, uh, do entorsion of the eye downward. So the eye in third cranial palsy appear to be deviated laterally and downward. Since the preganglionic fibers in, uh, lie near the surface, com so the compressive lesions of the nerve dilate the pupil, which is called surgical third nerve palsy. But in function of the central portion of the uh, oculomotor nerve as acrine diabetic of thermoplegia may spare the pupil which is called medical third nerve palsy. Fourth nerve palsy result in uh, extortion and weakness of downward and inward movement of the affected eye most marked when the eye is turned inward so the patient commonly complains of special difficulty in reading or going downstairs head tilting head tilting to the opposite shoulder is especially characteristic of fourth lesion. This maneuver it is a characteristic maneuver called Bolshevsky maneuver. This maneuver causes a compensatory entorsion of the unaffected eye and ameliorate the double vision. Lesion of the sixth nerve result in paralysis of central and or outward sorry lesion of the sixth nerve uh, result in paralysis of lateral or outward movement with incomplete sixth nerve palsy turning the head toward the side of the pyretic muscle may overcome diplopia now we talk about the visual loss the visual pathways represent one third of uh, supratentorial brain mass and are frequently affected by structural lesions and a wide range of neurological disorder the most important part of evaluating a patient with visual loss is to establish whether the visual loss is monocular or binocular painful or painless the temporal profile which means onset sudden acute subacute or chronic the course transient or permanent monocular visual loss result in sorry results from lesions anterior to the chiasma means prechiasmal the eye itself or the optic nerve is affected binocular visual loss results from either bilateral prechiasmal lesion or more likely from a chiasmal or retrochiasmal lesion diplopia the majority of normal eye movements are conjugate that's to say the the two eyes move in an equal distance in the same direction so diplopia arises from misalignment of the eye meaning that the image is not projected to same points on the two retinas 
as it most subtle it may be reported as blurred rather than double vision the monocular diplopia indicates ocular disease while binocular diplopia suggests a neurological cause closing either eye internal abort binocular diplopia sequent and diplopia are features of nuclear and infranuclear lesion diplopia can be analyzed by measuring the direction of separation and the distance between two images clinical approach to a patient with diplopia the most important part of the history when evaluating a patient with diplopia is to establish whether diplopia is binocular horizontal or vertical or oblique temporal profile uh, the onset and the course fluctuating or constant the cover and cover test is useful to localize the affected eye by disappear reappear of one of the two image the false image is the peripheral outer image the false image is always coming from the affected paralyzed eye now nystagmus is a repetitive toe and the flow movement of the eye it may consist of smooth oscillation of the approximately equal velocity and amplitude which is called pendular nystagmus or it may consist of alternating slow drifts which is called slow phase in one direction and a corrective resetting saccades called the quick phase and the other it is called jerk nystagmus nystagmus points should be determined for the description first the symmetry the direction the position of the eye which exacerbate or provoked nystagmus right or left upward or downward and last the amplitude fine or course now we talk about the optic nerve disorder the concept of optic neuropathy the types of optic neuropathy inflammatory vascular compressive toxic hereditary traumatic elevated intraocular pressure or elevated intraocular pressure the classical features of optic neuritis or optic neuropathy decreased visual acuity visual field defect relative afferent pupillary defect can see the optic disc in the fundus by the fundoscopic or thermoscopic examination swollen or shrinkage optic nerve which means change which means the change in the shape of optic disc color margin and vessels optic nerve disorders optic neuritis can be classified into two types anterior optic neuritis or papillitis or retrobulbary neuritis this slide show feature of optic neuritis optic neuritis is common inflammatory disorder of the optic nerve females more than f males are affected and ocular pain especially with the eye movements is very common optic neuritis is general term used to describe involvement of the optic nerve when there is a swelling of the optic disc in the terms of anterior optic neuritis or papillitis have been used when the clinical history and examination suggest optic neuritis but the optic disc appears completely normal the term will be will, will become retrobulbary neuritis is used optic neuritis is usually idiopathic but it is occasionally caused by contiguous inflammation of the meninges orbital or paranasal sinuses and may be also be caused by TB, syphilis and fungal infection. Optic neuritis is a common manifestation of multiple sclerosis but in patient who has no past history of neurological dysfunction, the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is not justified. The majority of cases occurs in patient 20 to 40 years old and is unilateral. In patient less than 20 years of age, optic neuritis is commonly bilateral. Visual loss may develop very rapidly but usually progresses for several days to weeks and an aching orbital pain exacerbated by eye movement is common so the treatment is occur with high dose of intravenous methylprednisolone makes the recovery of visual function occur more rapidly vision usually begins to improve within two weeks 
and the most patient experience and the most patient experience good visual recovery papillary edema this connotes bilateral optic disc swelling from raised intracranial pressure headache is a frequent but not invariable accompaniment this is a fundoscopic picture see the uh, large diameter vessels this is the veins is highly congested and the disc margin is not clear it is blurred there will be transient visual obscurations visual acuity is not affected unless accompanied by macular edema and hemorrhage the blind spot is enlarged and if the intracranial pressure is not reduced secondary optic atrophy and loss of vision eventually occur optic atrophy Optic atrophy is not a disease, it is a morphological sequelae of any disease that causes damage to the ganglionic cells and axons, which, which are first order neuron. Optic atrophy developed four to six weeks after the onset in the visual loss. The optic atrophy can be divided into a primary and secondary. Here in these pictures, picture to the right is optic, primary optic atrophy which follow acute or chronic lesion of the optic nerve or retina the disc is look like chalk white chalk يعني نقصد مثل الطباشير with cookie cutter sharp borders this the picture to the left secondary optic atrophy which follows papillary edema the disc is gray with shaggy borders from connective tissue proliferation now now we finish the uh, neuroophthalmology we start now with this order of the trigeminal system. If you take a look to this uh, figure, you see the trigeminal nerve and its three branches, the ophthalmic division called V1, the maxillary division V2, and the third division V3. Uh, first, trigeminal neuralgia is a facial pain syndrome of unknown cause. It is due to microvascular compression of the nerve by aberrant loop of superior cerebellar arteries or on occasion a tortuous vein is believed to cause the disorder aberrant loop mean يعني aberrant بالعربي mean زائغ يعني ما ماشي بطريقة فيما superior cerebellar artery or on occasion tortuous vein uh, is believed to be the cause compressing on the this uh, nerve pain is confined mainly to the area supplied by the second mean V2 and third V3 divisions of the trigeminal nerve lancinating pain uh, characteristically occurs and spontaneously abates there may be a coexisting continuous deep dull pain uh, sensory stimulation of trigger zone about the cheek nose or mouth by touch cold wind or talking or chewing can precipitate the pain the physical examination is usually normal and the image is usually normal but it appears that MRI should be obtained in the following groups to rule out a mass lesion or multiple sclerosis because similar pain may occur in multiple sclerosis when there is a plaque of MS, the trigeminal root or brainstem tumors and these possibilities should thus be considered in young patient and in all patient with physical neurological abnormalities on examination or in patients with no response to medical therapy. Remission of symptoms occur with, can be achieved by carbamazepine, Tegritol, occurs within 24 hours in such a high percentage of cases that some believe it to be diagnostic. The alternative of carbamazepine is triliptal, oxcarbazepine, uh, phenytoin also tried, baclofen, gabapentin, lamotrigine are also used. If the medical treatment is failed, there, is, there will be possible for semicrovascular decompressive surgery, and lastly, uh, gamma knife radio surgery of trigeminal nerve root is also can be used in drug resistant cases. Post herpetic neuralgia, herb is zoster or shingles, a vesicular skin eruption in the dermatomal distribution due to reactivation of varicella zoster virus in patients with a history of varicella infection, which is called chickenpox, where the virus remains latent in the dorsal root ganglia and the cranial sensory ganglia. With reactivation of vesicular skin eruption in dermatomal distribution, accompanied and followed by local pain and tenderness most frequently involving the thoracic segment and ophthalmic branch 
of the 50 cranial nerve, which is called zoster ophthalmicus. It is usually occur after age 50 and becomes increasingly common with advanced age in immune compromised patient and in patient with certain malignant disease like leukemia, lymphoma, and the incidence rate of 3.6 per 1,000 patient years. Herpes zoster is followed in about third of patient by post-herpetic neurology, which defined as a pain persisting more than 30 days and develop after the rash of the shingles resolves. The post-herpetic neurology is characterized by constant burning hyperpathic pain and the frequency increases with the age. The post-herpetic neurology subsides within 6 to 12 months in many patients, but in 50% of those over 70 years, the pain persists and it occurs in same dermatomal distribution as the previous bout of herpes zoster. Careful testing of painful area reveals decreased cutaneous sensitivity to pinprick. The other major complication of trigeminal herpes is decreased corneal sensation with impaired blink reflex, which can lead to corneal abrasion, scarring, and ultimately loss of vision. The intensity and the duration of the cutaneous eruption and the acute pain of herpes zoster are reduced by 7 to 10 days treatment with acyclovir. Corticosteroid also reduce the incidence of acute herpetic pain. Tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline may be more effective when combined with phenothiazine or opioids. If you start a low dose of tricyclic antidepressant within 48 hours of the onset of the rash and continue for 90 days, this will may reduce the incidence of acute herpetic pain and post-herpetic neuralgia. Pregabalin and gabapentin can also be used, while topical application of capsaicin cream, which act as a transient receptor potential action channel antagonist due to pleat pain, mediating peptide, which is called substance P, from peripheral sensory neurons can also be helpful, but is poorly tolerated. In otherwise intractable cases, weekly intrathecal administration of methylprednisolone may reduce the pain. Now facial nerve, the seventh nerve, is important mixed nerve with motor sensory and autonomic division. The examination of motor division starts from the top to and work down. Have the patient wrinkled forehead, frontal muscle, close eyes tightly, orbiculars oculi, show their teeth or vaccinator and pursed lips or blowing orbiculars oris. A lesion of the nerve trunk or its nucleus produce a lower motor neuron. Pulsy, it affects all the muscles partially or completely supplied by the nerve. If there is weakness of upper motor neuron distribution, get the patient to smile with the upper motor neuron lesion. Automatic or emotional facial expression will be more complete than movements to command. Bell's palsy, facial weakness of the lower motor neuron type caused by idiopathic facial nerve involvement outside the central nervous system and account, and its account for up to 70% of facial neuropathy. The cause unclear, but the disorder occurs more commonly in a pregnant woman and diabetic. Patient, an increasing evidence suggests that the area activation of herpes simplex virus type 1 infection in the geniculate ganglion, the facial weakness accompanied by pain above the ear, and according to the site of involvement, there may be impairment of taste, lacrimation, or hyperacusis. Most patients recover completely without a treatment, but this may take several days in some instances and several months in others. A poor a poor prognosis for complete recovery is suggested by severe pain at the onset and complete pulsing when the patient is first seen. Treatment is with antiviral agents alone. is not effective as corticosteroids, but the combination appears to be more effective than steroid alone. It, ha it has to be begin within five days of the pulsing. And artificial tears and ointment to prevent exposure keratitis and the eye should be taped shut overnight. About 80% of patients recover spontaneously within 12 weeks, even if recovery is incomplete, permanent disfigurement, or some other complication affects only about 16% of patients. Many people with belt palsy recover completely without treatment, as we said. Ramsey Hunt syndrome, it is defined as facial neuropathy accompanied by erythematous vesicular rash of the ear, so called herpes zoster oticus or vesicular rash of the mouth. It may count for up to 18% of facial neuropathies and will be mistaken for Bell's palsy if the external auditory canal 
mouth and tongue are not examined for vesicles. Unlike Bell's palsy, the, in Ramsey Hunt syndrome, other cranial neuropathy neuropathies can occur. So involvement of eighth, ninth, tenth cranial nerve are frequent, with up to fifty-three percent of adults suffering hearing loss, which did not improve in thirty-eight percent. And tinnitus and vertigo are also common. Treatment with oral antiviral dosages differ from what is effective for herpes simplex virus type 1 in Bell's palsy, so it requires more, higher dose, and longer duration. Loss of pharyngeal neuralgia is an uncommon pain syndrome present with either a, prox a, a paroxysmal pain that is identical in quality to that of trigeminal neuralgia or a continuous burning or aching discomfort. Pain, the pain is localized to the oropharynx, the tonsillar pillars, on the base of the tongue or the auditory meatus. The trigger area are usually around the tonsillar pillars, so the symptoms are initiated by swallowing or by talking. Paroxysm of pain may be accompanied by syncopal episodes caused by transient bradyarrhythmia. Taban, you know, this is due to vagal stimulation. The women are affected more often than men and symptoms begin at the some, a somewhat younger age than in trigeminal neuralgia. As we said, a neurological examination reveals no abnormal sign and the application of local anesthetic to the trigger area may block the pain's response. There will be a trial with carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine. Therapy usually produces dramatic relief and microvascular decompression has been used. Neuroautology The vestibulococular or cranial nerve has a purely special sensory efferent function. The nerve has two components, the cochlear nerve that detects the sound and the vestibular nerve that detects head and body motion. Dysfunction of auditory system manifested by tinnitus and hearing loss. The deafness divided into two, into two types. Conductive, the pathology limited to the external auditory canal or middle ear, and the sensory neural deafness, the lesion involving the cochlea and cochlear nerve and the central auditory pathways. The vestibular system. The vestibular apparatus is the sensory organ for detecting sensations of the equilibrium. The bony labyrinth encasing the membranous labyrinth, which is, consists of three dimensional, dimensional angular velocity transducers, which is called semicircular canals, and the 3D linear acceleration transducers, which is called otolith. The primary vestibular efferents transmit information mainly to the vestibular and nuclear complex and the cerebellum. There is an extensive connection between the vestibular and nuclear complex, cerebellum, ocular motor nuclei, and the brain stem reticular activating system, which are required to formulate appropriate efferent signals to the extraocular and skeletal muscle. The vestibular nucleus sends outflow to the ocular motor nuclei, spinal cord, cerebellum, and vestibular cortex. Projections to the cerebral cortex via the thalamus provide conscious awareness of head position and movement. Approach to the diagnosis of vertigo. First of all, define the symptom. The vertigo is typically described as a spinning, rotating, or moving. It is a false perception of movement rather than either or either of the patient or, or of their surroundings. Second, The duration of the illness. Third, temporal profile, continuous or recurrent. If it is episodic, what is the duration of the attacks? Fourth point is the differentiation between central and peripheral vertigo, which is lead us to the anatomical diagnosis. So in this table, the manifestation, uh, the brain stem or cranial nerve signs usually present in central while it is absent in peripheral. The auditory manifestation is usually not present, absent in central causes of vertigo while it is frequently occur in peripheral vertigo. The autonomic symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis it is plus minus in central while it is mostly occur in peripheral. The severity in the central vertigo is characterized by mild to moderate severity while it is severe and distressing in peripheral. The effect of eye closure it is not effective in central vertigo while it is very effective and suppress the vertigo in peripheral. The nystagmus it is maybe horizontal, rotatory, and can be vertical. It is multidirectional in, in central vertigo while it is 
almost always unidirectional and never vertical. The course is persistent in central vertigo while it is, while it is episodic in peripheral. The position of the head, the term positioning, which means with any movement of the head, this occurs in central vertigo. So the central vertigo is aggravated by any head movement, while in peripheral vertigo it is positional, means movement of a head to a special position. The final aim is to make a specific diagnosis. The recurrent vertigo is almost never due to a serious neurological problem. It is almost always due to one of three basically oral conditions. Oral mean ear problem. Benign position of vertigo, Meniere's disease or migraine. The more prolonged severe episodes of vertigo that occur with a vestibular neuritis can last four days. And this is also characteristic for vertigo originating from multiple sclerosis or infarction of the brainstem. Patients presenting with chronic dizziness, general medical problems such as hematological, cardiac, and metabolic should be excluded. Then examine the gait and the autonomic nervous system before consider the vestibular cause. Lastly, the causes of central and peripheral vertigo. First, paravestibular disorders causes benign positional vertigo, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, head trauma, toxic vestibulopathies. The central vestibular disorders, the causes are Wernicke encephalopathy, vertebral basilar ischemia and infarction, posterior fossa hemorrhage, multiple sclerosis, migraine. Treatment of acute and recurrent episodic vertigo is first bed rest, one to two days maximum, and vestibular sedatives such as prochlorpyrazine, cinarazine, and beta -acetine. Thanks.